Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm well aware that just after lunch, I seem to get these sessions. Uh, so I'll try and keep you awake, keep it as lively as possible, and I know you really want to know how to put in a good get application, so I'll try not to linger too long on my, on my project. Um, it didn't take four and a half years, though, so I've been at the university four and a half years, so just to <laughs> find out. Um, so first of all, I'll take you through the background to the project and the approach we took. Um, some of the constraints um, we had within the project itself, um, the results and successful outcomes, and of course the learning um, that that all brought about. Um, and then I can I'll go through the Green Gun application uh, in terms of how we got that information into into our uh, into our application. Um, so the the whole objective that we wanted to try and to achieve with this project, which was the reduction and reuse of energy in institutional data centres, or REM IDC, short, thankfully. Um, we had two data centres in the university, both very small. Um, I think at the time, uh, if, you, if you looked around for an example of how to green a data centre, you tended to look at much greater, much larger um, facilities. Um, so we were trying to break new ground, really, and trying to get the most out of, out of a much smaller facility. Um, and I think it's pretty typical of the kind of problems that we had within the within those spaces, um, which we'll see in a second, which uh, I think you'll recognise um, if you've got data centres in your, in your institution. Um, we have we had a, at that particular time, which was 2008, when we started this, we had a lot of focus on the environmental issues and sustainability. Um, so something that we, we, although we didn't have the money at the time to, to try and think about green, greening our data centres, we would love to have done that. And then we applied for just funding and thank, thankfully we got it. Um, and with the additional just funds, we then put this, this green IT, ICT slant on our project. Um, but of course that brought about new, new objectives that we also had to meet. One is that we needed to be this model, this exemplar for the for the uh, for the HEFE sector, that other people could follow us and see what we did and learn from that experience. Um, but we also had to, you know, didn't, we couldn't get distracted by this this new green ICT objective. Um, we need to make sure we still build a facility that would meet the business need for the next ten years. There are a lot of benefits to doing this. Um, obviously, there's the prestige and the um, enhancing the university's um, reputation. Um, one of the greatest, and I'll show you the results later uh, in a bit, and that's you know the, the low energy bills that resulted from um, from doing this project. Um, we're also able to what we learned, we're now respectfully applying to other, other other facilities. So you know it's, a, it's the green skills that we've taken on now within the within the institution, and we've been we've been working a lot with other institutions through this. Um, to help other institutions to apply those same best practices that we use and to help them also to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, so, the, the first thing we needed to do, we, we first of all moved all our stuff into, into a temporary room so we didn't disturb the current computing facility. Um, we went out and looked at examples of best practice out there, both in institutions and in the commercial sector. In fact, we probably learned more about what not to do <laughs> And what to do, which was, uh, was quite enlightening. So we knew we really were breaking new ground when we, when we started this. Um, but the most important thing that I think that we did in this entire contract was we opted for design and build contract. And what that essentially means is we say, well, here's our space, and this is what we need from this space. This is what we want to achieve, and then we give that out on a tender, you know, and say, you tell us how you're going to deliver that. Um, and by the way, we need these efficiencies and we need to, need to apply these best practices and these standards. Okay, so we're quite specific about what it was we wanted from the facility, but in the way that it was delivered was up to the supplier. And, and the great thing about that is that the supplier takes ownership. So if, they, if, if, like many of you, you don't know what's gone on in your data centre for the last 10 years, and then you don't know where the cables run, you don't know where the power comes from, because nobody's ever labelled anything, and there's no diagrams to show you what a visor is, and what's going running through that visor, what services are running above your data center. It doesn't matter. If the, if the supplier hasn't done their homework and they run into those problems when they run to the project, they have to stump up the cost to 
fix it. And you don't. You've got a fixed cost, and you know exactly how much it's going to cost, and you know, it becomes a problem. Um, but it does make it quite difficult to evaluate different proposals because they're all different. <laughs> so it's kind of a bit of apples and pears when you're trying to uh, compare them. Because we didn't want a massive influx of, of proposals to start with, we put out what's called a pre-qualification questionnaire. Um, that basically just simplified the selection procedure, so we at least could take out those people who weren't financially viable or, or, or didn't put any effort into, into completing that, that, that start of the contract. Um, so the invitation to tender had all the best practice and all the kind of British international standards. Now this was the old data centre. Um, we had all kinds of problems. We have uh, pillars that are inside, but this bulkhead, which, tended to, which is indicated by this red line, um, that was lower than the ceiling height, trapped all the hot air. Um, we had, we had um, a workspace here that, um, that just kind of flowed into the main data centre space and tended to have rubbish build up in there. Um, yeah, we had, we had underfloor capacity was only very small, so consideration of blowing air under the floor wasn't, wasn't something we could consider. Um, we, uh, we had a meeting point for all the, all the networking. So all the networking, when the, when the building was built, first built, all the networking was put into the network cabinets where they, where they currently sat. Completely, you know, complete tension there. There was no slack. So it was even difficult to even lift up the cabinets to put new tiles underneath. So we certainly couldn't move them. So that was another problem we needed to, to overcome. Um, uh, the capacity, we had far too little capacity, not good enough cooling, you know, lot, lots and lots and lots of issues that we needed to deal with. Now, so this is the new data centre. Um, so what we did was took over these, these two meeting rooms and created a workspace there. So no longer were the people who were working over there working within the data centre, they were working in a space next to it. Um, we separated off the UPS plant space um, because uh, that enabled that environment to, to be separate and distinct from the data centre environment. Uh, one of the best practices in the data centre now is to turn the heating up. Uh, turn the heating up, turn the heat up so that the inlet temperature for the surface is as hot as possible because some industry experts reckon that for every one degree you increase the temperature that you put into a surface, was saving 4% more power in. Okay, that's a big number. So the hotter you can get your data center, um, the more power you're saving. But but these UPSs have batteries in them, and batteries do not like heat. They like to be about 20, 21 degrees centigrade. So you want to keep that environment cold, which is in a different room. That's great. Um, but this environment you want to warm, you want to heat up. Um, we also moved all the all the backs into what's called a hot and cold aisle arrangement. Um, so you've got the cold air, relatively cold air, that comes out of the across the floor, goes in through the front of the um, racks, and across the surface it heats up about 10 degrees. So it comes out the back here at about 10 degrees hotter. So if it comes in here at 21, it comes out here at 31 approximately, then it gets that hot air gets funneled away and goes goes out and we've got some what's called free cooling um, so basically the ambient temperature in the air is cooling the, the, the hot air bringing it down to um, a, a lower temperature which if only if we have to we will then turn on the condensers to cool it even further but for 86% of the year um, we, we use minimal or no chillers at all. Okay, so we get some elements of free cooling for 86% of the year. The other time, the other, I think it's about 30 days where we are in, in Hertfordshire, it's about 30 days of the year where the temperature's too hot to, to give us that, that advantage, so we have to turn off the chillers. Um, so, so keeping the, the hot and cold aisles separated and, and contained enables us to get that benefit, that free air, and, and therefore um, saving us a lot of a lot of money on cooling. And cooling makes up a substantial part of your data centre's operational costs. 
as you'll see. Um, so this is um, this is the anticipated uh, power saving. So before, for 120 kilowatts of IT load, facility was taken 264 kilowatts. Now, those were the figures that we, we measured prior to the, the project starting. Um, so we anticipated after the project completed that for the same IT load, we'd only be using 146 kilowatts. Now, the, the majority of that saving, like I say, is in the cooling. It's keeping those hot and cold arms separate. Um, but there's also a lot of electricity losses that we also dealt with as well. Um, so you can see a massive difference in the amount of electricity we use and a big saving in our carbon footprint. Um, and for people who like that kind of thing, we've quoted it into the number of cars you can basically take off the road um, due to the savings. Um, and so this was, this was beforehand. This is how our data centre used energy prior to the project. We approximated our PUE. Now PUE, for those who don't know, is power usage effectiveness. And basically it's a ratio of the amount of power you use in the facility to the amount of power you use purely for the IT equipment. Okay? So a, a PUE of 2.2 means that we're using 120% more power to house the IT servers than we are actually using to power the IT servers. Okay? So that's a hugely inefficient data. But I have to say for some small utility, for some small facilities, um, the average PU is about three. So it is actually a lot worse than that out in some institutions. And the cooling system took up 42% of that total power. The IT load, 45% electrical wastage, 13%. And this was afterwards. So now we're down to 1.19, well 1.19 is 1.3, the average over the year is 1.26. So the IT load, of the whole of the power being used for the data center, the IT load has um, increased from 45% to 80% of that power. So now we're using the power mostly to power the IT and not to power the room that holds the IT. And you can see the biggest difference has been in the cooling. We've gone from 42% down to 19%. And electrical percent usage has decreased, at least electrical losses um, have gone down to Third, from 13% to 1%, and they're actually so small, I can hardly measure them. Um, because I'll start to get into rounding errors. So um, it's, been a, it's been a big, big change in the efficiency of the data. So, what, what are the, what, why did this act as an exemplar? Um, well, basically, if, if you refurbish a building, you're not building anything. There's a lot of um, embedded carbon in just building. So if you're not building, you know, immediately you've got a green, you've got a green project to start with. Um, we also reused a lot of the equipment, a lot of the cabling, a lot of the pipes, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the tiles. Uh, we reused as much as we could possibly could. So we tried not to throw anything away, and actually um, our waste recycling rate was 80 percent, 80 percent of what we what we took out and we had to end up disposing of, 80% of that was recycled. Um, as I said, we used free air cooling for 86 of the year. Uh, we had a ward, well, warm winter, so I've not quite had as good figures this, this winter as I did the winter before. And that's, you know, that's, that's basically how it works. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is the key figures. Because we also, we didn't just uh, refurbish a day centre, we also um, consolidated and we virtualized at the same time and we actually were a bit gung-ho about it and we, we did a lot of that and that reduced our IT footprint quite considerably. So we went down from 23 max of equipment down to 15 max um, and by the time we'd actually moved back into the data centre we were actually down to 13 max of equipment. Okay? So we've actually really reduced the amount of tin that we have in our, our data centre um, and so we, we created 69% more capacity, um, but with the project and the, the, the virtualization consolidation, um, there's a 55% reduction in our carbon footprint. And this is this is the big figure. I uh, calculated it yesterday actually, and I had to 
double, double and treble trip with my figures. For last year, 2011, um, we saved £186,000 on a 75 meter data centre, which is a tiny data centre. So you can imagine what, what you can do if you've got a data centre um, of that size. Um, so, yeah, there's, it's basically, and this is another key thing is we the first university in Europe to achieve compliance against an EU code of conduct for data centres. Um, this is some of the learning we did. There's a lot more information about this um, on the, uh, I think there's a link to it on the website. But, um, on, so now if we go to the actual application form, how we, how we feel we did a, um, a successful application. If you look at the way you apply for the Green Gander, well, it's in two stages. The first stage, um, you have to break it down to the sum of initiative benefits and significance of the sector. The second stage, it's exactly the same. <laughs> so you find yourself coming to the second stage thinking, how do I say this a bit differently to what I said the first time? Um, so basically, at the second stage, you've got to go into a lot more detail um, on particularly those last two sections of benefits and significance of the sector. Okay? There's limited space, you've only got so many words that you can enter, so you have to be quite brief. Um, brevity must be one of your strong points when you have a new application. Um, and it's really good to put in your real life benefits, not just projections. Because you're going to be, you're going to be judged on what is the real, the real impact of your project. Um, I, I'd suggest, I mean, you, you, know, you can do it your own way, but I suggest things like highlighting the benefits in the paragraphs is quite a good way of doing it and bolding them. Um, significance of the sector is really the key section, I think. Um, if you can really demonstrate how you brought, you brought new knowledge into the sector and, and how other people have learned from what you've been doing, I think that's a really great way of, of getting yourself a leg up in the award. Um, and, and use hyperlinks. If you've got examples of where you've spoken about your case study or anything like this, you know you've got case studies that have been published, then use those, bring those into your, into your application. You can't really see this, so I'm going to switch to this. This is my second stage application. And so you can see here in the benefits section, now I've, I've kind of just highlighted the key points I wanted to get across. Remember that judges are going to be looking at a lot of, a lot of applications, and they're going to be wanting to be focusing in on the things that are important. So guide them, guide them to where those, those focus points are. Uh, And, and if you can, include some charts, include some, some pie charts. Remember, this is stage two, so there isn't a word limit. Don't think there was a word limit in stage two uh, for that section. So um, you can include information. And then significance for the sector. Um, this, we talked a little bit, really, about why this project was so important for the sector. Um, and then why our project made a difference. Um, and then, in, as you can see here, we had a blog, we linked to the blog, we linked to our website, that described our project, um, with the case studies that have been written about it, um, and then talked about any of the, the, the places where we went to, went to speak at. So I hope that gives you um, a good sense of what um, we think, anyway, is a good application and a sense of why our project won the Big Game Awards. And I'll take any questions. Yes, you were so good with an ICT, or did you um, engage, say, states and teams in terms of monitoring for our progress? That was to install. Yeah, that was how wide in the institution you did it, so it's basically we're an ICT team. No, that, I think that was one of the key points we got across in our application was that uh, we really we really worked together very closely with the states, and in fact uh, um, we included states on the project board, and we and we included in our project discussions the environmental team and the energy manager. So so it was real team effort across the university to make sure that we were delivering an environmentally sustainable data centre, not just another IT project. Did the 
we talk about we've got this uh, first um, component in the code called that get. What was that information did that come through the IT uh, team or was that in the environment team that you're aware of? So you can how that got on to the agendas. Um, that actually came about when we were doing some research into best practices. <clears throat> we were made aware through the BCX, British Community Society, of the EU Code of Conduct <clears throat> because they're pushing it. Excuse me. <clears throat> they're, they're pushing it quite hard. <clears throat> and, um, and what we did was put that in the ITT. So, so the, the people who came to refurbish knew that we needed to be able to apply for the EU Code of Conduct for data centres and become compliant with it following the refurbishment. And it, it did make it a lot easier, I have to say. So well, they did it back. Um, Interesting because the, the money had always always been there to refurbish the data centre when I joined the university four and a half years ago. So I, I knew that we wanted to do it, and that's why I've been brought on as a data centre manager because the university had had one prior to that. Um, <clears throat> and then we we had half the amount we had um, three hundred thousand plus back to to refurbish our data centre. And when we initially looked at it, we thought well, that's not very much money. We're just going to do a box standard refurbishment. It was implied for those JISC funds that gave us that extra 300,000 on top that enabled us to do the green ICT element. Um, obviously, to apply for JISC funds, you've got to have the backing of your senior you know, management team on the, at the university. Um, and so everyone was very keen because they saw this as, as you know, enhancing the reputation of the university. And thankfully, we did that. This funny thing about JISC money is that it's not the end product that they really care that much about. They care about the journey. So if you can show a good journey but not have an end product, they don't actually mind that much. But we were quite fortunate because we had, a, we had not only a great story to tell, but we also had a very good um, end product. So we're thankful for both of that. So important the reputation? Uh, I think so. But also the saving the money. I mean, it's funny because the projections were that we'd save around £40,000 per year. Um, but we ended up saving £176,000 last year. And, and that's, you know, gasp of astonishment for my senior management there because they never believed that's we'd have such an impact. What's feedback giving? Because that's always the first question yeah. when you look at the funding is payback giving, and it's more than five years to get it. Yeah. So whenever I, I always ask if it's sort of three or four years. I think it's really crucial, and I, and I think it takes a leap of faith for people sometimes, because um, especially if you haven't got any examples, if you've got any examples of people doing this, and there were, there were no good examples in the HE sector that we could draw on. You know, we had some, some, some universities were doing some good stuff, but it was very small, very localised, and, and, and you couldn't really compare what we wanted to do, what they were doing. For instance, Cardiff University, they had, they had um, at the time, it was quite innovative uh, pod they were using for their HPC. Um, and it, it was very good, you know, and it, 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 it was very impressive to go and look at it and look at, see what they'd done. Um, but it didn't really, you couldn't translate it to what we were trying to do because they were looking at HPC and we were looking at um, enterprise computing for the university as a whole. So we've got time. We'll make this the last question. Last one. Yeah. Should we use, you mentioned we use it for your project. Yes, we did. Sorry, I didn't mention that. Um, we, what we did was um, we, we, we took the, the, the waste heat that comes out the back of the surface, because it's contained, we funnel it away and heat exchange it to a liquid. It's actually a um, water glycol mix. Um, and then we take that up to a domestic hot water system, which has a preheating contained next to it, and that preheats the water. So the water would normally be 7 degrees, and you'd heat it up to 60 degrees. Um, we can preheat it to 40 using the waste heat from the data centre, um, so it's only got another 20 degrees to go. Um, if that hasn't taken all the heat out, then it goes out to the 
top of the building where it goes into some dry cools that look a bit like car radiators, um, where it gets rid of the rest of the heat um, through the ambient air. Um, but yes, that, and that system cost us £7,000, and we envisage a payback of two years to two and a half years, depending on how much hot water we use within that building that houses the data. Or washing your hands. <laughs> <laughs> <I> mean, showers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been turning up just um, very carefully because you can't do that in big stages. Um, so we've turned it up a couple of degrees since we first started, and I'm turning it up. I'll be. My intention is it's a, it's, a, it's a company running. It's pushing air out under the floor at 19 degrees at the moment. Okay, but that that's 21 degrees by the time it hits the front of the, front of the surface. That's still far too cold for me. But we're still getting great, that, great results, even from that. But I want to get it up to somewhere between 28 and 30 degrees. Okay. Um, because um, that, like I say, the massive amounts of savings. So I think there's still more to come. It's just a case of tweaking it over the coming kind of months. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about our, um, our project that we did at Blackpool um, College, which was a small scale compared to the last one um, in comparison. Um, and it was the title of it was Driving Ahead with Waste Oil. Basically, it started in July 2010. After it actually started after I've been to my first EAUC conference. Um, and there was a company there called Green Fuels Limited, and they were sort of advertising these fuel pods. Um, I'd only been in post about a year at this point, and wanted something big, something different for the college to get people on board and get um, people, rec you know, the, the, the idea of sustainability recognised. So I came back from the conference and I pitched this idea and did a business case, um, and it was sort of like got excited, you know, we're going to have the refectories involved and the curriculum involved and the estates people involved, um, but it was a lot more difficult than, than that. Um, so we finally uh, got a trial running in July 2010 and the college began recycling the waste vegetable oil, which was difficult to start off with. Um, they were just used to sending it off and they'd get 50p back for each 20 to 25 litres. So, and they it was a case of you've got to make sure that they weren't storing it too long in the kitchens, that it had to be shipped out, we had to have an area, and there was a number of different issues that we had when we first started off, because we only wanted, um, we only had a trial period for a month, so we only wanted a small batch of oil, and it all got a bit complicated. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, is, that was good about the fuel pod is that it only takes 24 hours to complete a batch, and it was a 50 litre batch. Um, machine because uh, we only intended to produce up to 2,500 litres in a year. Otherwise, after that, you'd start paying tax. And we had a delivery van that, because we've got to four different campuses, that travelled about 60 miles, 70 miles a day. So we thought this would be just right to run the delivery van for the year each week. Um, and obviously, the issue was that you're not using the diesel, so the environmental benefits were much better. Uh, and you're not producing, technically using rapeseed oil or anything like that. Um, you're using waste oil from the canteen, so it wasn't even having to be transported anywhere either. Um, what, are the, what we did, which I think is important for the Green Gown applications, we did. I had to do a business case in the first instance to get this project put through, pushed through. And the partners weren't just the estates team. It was about getting the college on board. Um, so the first, first instance, it was coming up to July and we have we had a foundation degree co-students and they needed a placement. So we found one, um, it was a mature student who'd actually already done biodiesel, so that was helpful. Helped me out in a few ways. Um, and then we introduced academic studies, uh, motor vehicle, engineering into the into the mix as well. Um, 
they came, like, it was mainly at the beginning, the tutors that came along chatted with us, uh, we showed them the product, how it could be done, what the processes were, and then they were to go back and then discuss it with their curriculum areas. Um, for the first 12 months, the project was kept in the estate department because we wanted to send it to most vehicle, but they didn't have a room as such, so we had to hold on to it. And the idea at the very beginning was to get the estates team, the estates maintenance and supervisors, to actually produce the bioneys themselves. But I'll go into that later, because that didn't run smoothly. And then in September of last year, the motor vehicle uh, department took that over. Uh, they have their own room and they have um, apprenticeship students running it along with staff. And they have about three or four vehicles that they run. Um, the project goals, um, and can I just say that I've laid this out, this presentation, the way that when you write it sort of, after you've got your Green Gang Award, they send you a sort of layout for, I think it's like a summary, isn't it? Of, of your, so that's how I've laid, this out, laid it out as the AACUC wanted it. Um, so the project goals were to raise awareness for environmental technologies and demonstrate the college's commitment because I'd only been there a year, a lot of people didn't know about me, even though I've gone to the rain and done so many things. I thought, this, this is a good, this, this is what we'll do, you know. Um, and we wanted to produce and utilise fuel for college vehicles, or a vehicle, um, and just kind of show off, really, that we are doing this, there's something different. Um, and one of the main issues, is one of the main things that we wanted is to get it into the curriculum, to get it taught, to not to just this be an estate thing, because everyone thinks that that's where it starts, sustainability, and a lot of people think that's where it ends. So we want to get into the curriculum and get the tutors and the students talking about it. Um, and obviously we want the environmental reputation as well. The obstacles and the solutions. We have numerous problems. Um, health and safety was one, and we all love our health and safety advisors. Um, hated the idea, absolutely hated the idea. Um, we had it in a storeroom, we had um, a special case to put all the chemicals in, which were very hazardous, as we said, but you weren't actually handling the chemicals yourself. You had a pump system, and that was the only time you actually saw the chemicals, and then you left the room, or it was well ventilated. But we had a nightmare with that trying to get them to agree, and all the safety precautions, and all the signage, and everything. Um, risk assessments, it was a nightmare. Um, we had a very small, limited number of staff working on the project because basically after we'd trained the estate staff up, they didn't really want to do it. They didn't want to be responsible for going near dangerous chemicals, even though the majority of cleaning chemicals were just as harmful, they didn't want to be responsible or responsible for producing a batch of biodiesel that maybe would have <laughs> impacts on the delivery van and cause issues. So. I, in my end, I worked for Nate for 12 months and I brought in different members of staff that worked along with me. Um, but it, the idea, obviously, was to get maintenance staff to do it, but that didn't work. Um, we had uh, access issues to... We, the building that it was in was being overclad. So it was restricted for about four months or something. And we couldn't actually get access to that room where it was and we couldn't boot it anywhere else. So. The initial thoughts were when you're going to put a project through for the Green Gown Awards, oh God, this isn't a gap in the, in the results. I've had a, you know, a fall down, but um, we put it through anyway. And you know, we, we mentioned that this is what's happened, but this will still be our savings. It'll take a bit longer to get the uh, savings, the cost savings, and the environmental benefits. But um, we put it through anyway. Um, and then you've also got the disposal of the new used waste oil, which in the end we just uh, sent it back to the recycling company. It was just, there was just less of it. It was basically anything that couldn't be reused, that had too much fat in it or too many bits of food in it, we sent back. But it was very few, far between, that we sent back. Um, when we did the application, this was this is the second stage. We did do this in the first stage, and. 
this actually initially came from the Green Fuels Limited Company. So we just we uh, we did it for us. Um, and as you can see, we can work out we worked out carbon emission savings um, over five years and cost savings. So it was um, only in the third the third year of the year we're on now is that we've actually started to see or get our get money back for investing in it because we did have the issues in the first year of not having access to it, so we couldn't produce the biodiesel. But from talking to other colleges and universities that have sent applications in for the grant, Green Grant Awards and have done well, they like the stats. That's what I've been told. They like the stats, they like real information and data that they can be used, that people, because if you send this in as a case study after you've done your Green Grant, other people can look at this and go, oh yeah, it's just easy to relate to, but uh, the green, for the Green Grant Awards, they like their information, they like their data. Um, lessons learnt. It's always good to say, we've done this, it's fantastic, boast, boast, boast. But there's, even if you're doing something for social responsibility, not just the more sort of practical projects, there's always lessons to be learned. And that's what people learn from. So they want to see that type of thing as well. Um, not just, we did this, it was fantastic, we involved all these students. People want to know, oh, and relate to it. Yeah, we've had those problems as well. So we decided to run the delivery van on a 730 biodiesel mix to diesel, just basically to keep the states happy, because they weren't happy when we got 100% that you can trust it. We started off at about uh, 60, 40 towards diesel, and then we got it to 70, 30 to biodiesel. Um, they were just a bit skeptical, they weren't too sure, um, because at the, same, at the end of the day, it was a home kit. Um, but we didn't have any problems at all. And obviously, one of the years that we were running it was the coldest year. And we had it in, in um, like a garage type thing, story. And we had to change the ratios. And we had to, it luckily it was right next to the boil house, this room. So you can buy stuff to stop it freezing and, and crystallizing the biodiesel. But we didn't have any issues. It was quite toasty in there, thankfully, because the rest of the college was freezing. So. Uh, Biodiesel was fine though. Um, and the other issue is with it, you can only run it on the older engines. You can't run it. I wanted to run it on my car, which is turbo diesel, but you can't. So I couldn't even sneak any of it out because you, you can't put it on, on the modified diesel engines, which isn't really good for the future. So, um, and the glycerine that's produced can be recycled. It's sort of a sticky layer you get at the top. Um, after you've, um, well, it's sticky lead ends at the bottom, and you just uh, get rid of that, drain it off, and then you've got your bodies to pump into your vehicle. Um, and that can actually be used in motor vehicle or vocational for cleaning things, but we haven't done that as yet. They've collected it and they've recycled it and said, but we can do that if we wanted to. Um, top tips. Now, I spoke, I came up with this, and I spoke to marketing as well. I was like, what can we come up with? top tips for not just for a practical project but for the social responsibility and the curriculum it doesn't matter what kind of um, green gown you're going for so we came up with these select the award carefully it's got to be something whatever you're writing it's got to be something different it's not got to be something that's already been done even if it's already been done it needs to have a twist on it, it needs to be a lot of people have done IT in the past Yours was something different, it was a bit special. And I think that's when people go wrong. They go, oh yeah, well, we've got this new course and curriculum, isn't it great? But there's nothing exceptional or different about it. Um, the word count was an issue. I'm trying to get a summary in like 50 words or 100 words that was snappy, because uh, that's not my best area. So uh, sometimes it was a case of marketing PR person. Come on, please help me, how can we do this? Um, uh, because I've also discovered by talking to different people at the EAUC that it's not always the people who've done the project that write the submissions. Some, co some colleges, universities get external people in to write them. So I was thinking, oh, God, I've never written one of these before. I spoke to a few places that do that, which is fair enough. So 
as I got to marketing, because I like marketing, on with them, and they're a bit punchier, they know how to write things better. Um, so it's just a case of how can I make this more interesting, really, once we put the facts and figures down. Um, it's important to clearly state the aims of the projects and refer to how those aims have been achieved in the answers. It's no good just saying, we've done this, isn't that great? You need to know how, why, what benefits have been. And you've got to be specific about why the project was beneficial to the organisation as a whole, students, staff, stakeholders, as many people as possible, community, everybody, anybody that's seen it. Because uh, I really like the idea of putting the links in as well, I haven't thought of doing that, but I like that idea. Um, and the positive project outcomes, um, both in facts and figures, but also uh, qualitative and quantitative. So they like the facts and figures, but they also like it bullet pointed and explained, and this is what we did, and why, and this, that, and the other. Um, and then they also want the short term benefits and the long term benefits as well. So, yes, yeah, so what happens when this project finishes? What will be the benefits? Is it just end, or is it going to go in the curriculum, or is it going to keep saving money, or are you going to move on to another project? So, those kind of things are important. Um, and I think, particularly for me from the state, you don't always think about the impact on the students. Um, even if it direct, it does, it, in any case, it will impact on the students, whether it's IT, estates, or uh, a new build, or anything like that. So what was that impact? Was it positive, negative? What will be the long-term impacts? <laughs> and finally, uh, project rates and the profile of an organisation. So we've got a, a lot of, um, we've got a lot of press interest, um, PR obviously managed to get the paper, a lot more interested with the college, uh, staff coming up to me and talking to me now, going, oh, you're so and so. So, and a lot more interest from the curriculum side as well. So it was, it was very useful. And we've also got a little logo on the website as well. So yeah, it, it was very beneficial for the organisation to get the hand commended. So that's it. Any questions? Yes. You, you said quite early on it though about the um, uh, impact your health and safety people had. Yeah. Could you go through that a little bit? Was that actually coming from the reluctance of the estate staff who then or health and safety in on their side, or was it people on that? I'm, I'm surprised at that. It was, there was um, issues, I think, within the team. I think I found out later on that um, engineering already wanted to do biodiesel, and for some reason it had not started, or the plans had not gone through. And the health and safety were good friends with engineering, so they tried to put the stuff on. They did literally went out of the way um, found found um, information that wasn't even linked. Like this chemical does this, this, this chemical does that. No, it doesn't. And it, it, it was ridiculous the amount of. But luckily, I have a fantastic uh, management team, and they just decided this is what we're doing. So every single obstacle we came up against, we just we just over we all came it. Did a risk assessment. We did this. We did everything everything possible. Everything they wanted us to do, we did it. But it was, and um, it went on for quite a few months trying to get it pushed through and stay. The, the, the political stuff made sense. Yeah, it, yeah, it was a bit of fun. I understand. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about uh, only being able to use normal vehicles. Yeah. Uh, we come across this one, just talking to uh, um, companies that were looking at fleet replacement in the next year. Yeah, um, we've had a few issues because it, it, when you think about it, well, how is this the future? Because I know that there is about five to ten percent of biodiesel in, um, in in diesel as a whole. When you go and fill up your car, they do put it in there. But it is an issue if they think if they're saying that this is the future of fuel, or well, it's not really. But if you know some people are saying that, but you can't use it in new cars, so we've not really overcome that yet. Because it's 30% mix, so do you think if you 
Yeah, it's um, it acts as a lubricant, so it, it moves, it can clog up the engine basically. It moves all the dirt that's in there. Um, so with the new new systems, it can actually clog up the engine by cleaning it out, uh, which is fine for the older vehicles, but not so much for the new vehicles. So it is something we are looking at. But, uh, we haven't got the answer to share. So the beer's retail value, we no longer use it. continue doing it anyway. Yeah. At the moment, yeah. Because we've only got small we're not expanding it, we're only having a small amount. <coughs> and we will continue to have all the vehicles at the moment anyway. So we'll always for for the sort of next ten years or so we'll always have a vehicle that can run on it storage if I have not been. So yeah. Just wondering, um can you use it for anything else the vehicles You can use it um I think the student took it home you can just burn it. <laughs> But it's it was actually worked out cheaper to bring to burn something else. Or something. It, the best it, to actually get any money back on it, it's best to use it as an alternative to diesel or petrol. Um, otherwise, it's yeah, it's just not. We just worth. introduced a, an electric car. Right. So I was just thinking if we could make use of it somewhere else. Yeah. <coughs> um, it, you could. Yeah, you could do that. It just I think it just works out. Just because of the cost of diesel petrol, you get your money back quicker. Yeah, that's the benefit of it. What did you say, sir? Generators. We always find generators to back to speed get through quite a lot of things in the year in general. Yeah. So, you do 2,000 years a year. Who checks up? Do you just. You're just supposed to keep a record, and if they came around, yeah, you could technically go over it. You could technically make adjustments as, as you know, how you do it. Um, <coughs> but we've just decided we're not going to expand. So, because it does, I it, it, it said it takes 24 hours to do a full batch. But if you've got commitments and you're doing things, I mean, I found it a struggle when I started because I'd only do one batch a week because I had a meeting and I couldn't go back to it. And then I had to leave it overnight. Oh my God, when am I going to fit in time to do the test? Which only takes 10 minutes to do a test, just a titration test. Really easy. But you've got to put everything on and go out. And then, it didn't take that long, but in between everything else that you're doing, for, for me, myself, it took me about four days to do a batch. But if you if it was a, if it was done at four days, it's slightly better, yeah. You could get a few batches out a week easily at the organisation. So. Yeah, it was um, yeah. They've done everything, yeah. They just take it. Did, we um, did some training with them, make sure they understood it. They did a risk assessment. They had to do the whole risk assessment for the new area and the cosh and everything like that. And now they've taken over it, yeah. And that is your staff costs stayed steady? Sorry? Does your cost, labour costs, stayed steady for five years? Yeah, because we've got students doing it now, and one member of staff. It was always just one. So you're paying the students? No, they're, a, they're on apprenticeships. So what, what's the labour cost? Oh, it's sort of what we've worked out for an hour's staff working. It's, we're not actually paying someone to do it, but it's an hour of their, of their oh, work. Okay, right. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Steve Jones, I'm from Hampshire <coughs> College and I'm going to give an overview of the work we've been doing on carbon reduction and space efficiency at Hampshire College. Uh, Pembrokeshire College is based in Hampton West in Pembrokeshire, uh, we're a small uh, county town uh, college. Uh, we have about 10,000 students enrolled every year, we've got about 550 staff. Uh, and sort of football coming through the door every uh, year, sorry, every day, about 1,500 to 2,000 students. Uh, this is the main sort of college building. Uh, in the centre, you've got the main college building, which was built uh, around 20, 25 years ago. Uh, and on the left, uh, you've got a more sort of recent developments, which is a construction technology centre and an innovation centre. Uh, we're landlocked by housing and uh, Greenbelt and Woodland. So our sort of developments and opportunities are quite sort of limited. 
One of the reasons we've looked at for uh, carbon reduction uh, and the way we sort of approach uh, sustainability at college uh, are increasing regulations, decks, climate change levy, uh, climate change and sustainability, uh, and also from a college point of view, uh, our corporate responsibility to do something, uh, marketing and funding bids, uh, we use the information that we've uh, and what we've achieved in, our, in terms of our marketing material now, and we find more and more when we're putting funding bids in for European funding, uh, that many of the questions that now we're asking are environmental questions and what do you do in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, and also reducing our energy bills. So our approach to good energy management. Uh, we have senior management support. Uh, I report on a monthly basis to the senior management team what they're doing in terms of environmental and sustainability. Uh, and that has now fed down to all teams. So all team meetings now have space management and sustainability as a standard agenda item. We have a sustainable development and environmental committee uh, with student representation. And we audit our requirements. This was a key starting point for us when we first started this sort of process in 2002-03. Uh, where were we now and where did we have to sort of go in the future? Uh, and that's updated and reviewed on a regular basis. And from that sort of audit, we've set out a manageable ongoing improvement plan. Uh, and to support that and to give us good benchmarking information, uh, a key thing for us is good data, statistics, to look at where we're improving and what we need to do. We provide regular promotion of what we have been, what has been done, uh, both sort of staff and students to get their sort of buy-in. And we regularly promote environmental awareness, again, to sort of staff and students. We invest into viable projects, going back to the sort of plan, uh, that we talked about earlier. Uh, we've looked at sort of what projects will give the best sort of payback period in terms of 12, 24 months. We've invested in that, delivered those projects, so we've built up sort of credibility so we can invest in sort of further projects. We invested in 2003-2004 into a quite comprehensive building management system. Uh, and we don't just have it sort of sitting in the corner in the office. Uh, that's reviewed on a daily basis and we react to sort of weather conditions. Uh, so during the sort of winter months, if we do have some warmer days, uh, the controls are adjusted accordingly. We set targets on kilowatt hour per square metre basis uh, as a general sort of benchmark in progress. Uh, and awareness of energy consuming equipment is quite a key thing for us in terms of what curriculum areas may buy in or IT departments. So in terms of the projects sort of delivered uh, over the last sort of eight to nine years, four years ago we completed a new 3.2 million pound construction technology centre, which was the first further education building in the UK to achieve real excellence at both design and post-construction assessment stage. Two years ago we completed a new 3.8 million A-rated engineering facility. Uh, as part of that sort of project, uh, we had a live renewable demonstration roof. And we've installed, as part of the Construction Technology Centre project, a uh, biomass boiler uh, that now supplies 19% of the college floor area uh, for heating. We've introduced rainwater harvesting as part of the capital projects. Uh, We've expanded the building management system, so that now controls heating, hot water, and air conditioning. As part of the sort of newer projects, we have solar thermal installations for hot water. Uh, across the whole of the college, we've installed dry urinals, low flush toilets, and spray taps uh, into all toilet areas. And this is an ongoing sort of development project in terms of installing daylight and movement sensor to control light fittings. And we're probably up to about 75% of the college floor area now has got those installed. But more recently, we've installed an automatic meter monitoring and targeting system. Uh, this was a part of a pilot study for FE colleges in Wales. Uh, this system was installed in five colleges across Wales as part of that. 
uh, pilot project uh, and the initial first year savings for those five, five colleges is estimated to be £260,000. Energy controls and thermostat upgrades. Uh, the main sort of college building is 22, 25 years old. Uh, and what we've sort of found that some of the original controls are old, not working, they can tamper with. So we've gone through and sort of uh, updated those over the last two to three years. Uh, and improved control of ventilation extraction systems, because very often we were finding those are running 24-7. So just a couple of visuals from uh, some of the projects. Uh, this is the new construction technology centre, which, the, which is a very excellent building. Uh, this is the uh, wood pellet hopper for the construction technology centre, uh, biomass. Uh, we went for a big hopper to cut down on deliveries. Uh, so this holds 21 tonnes of pellets. Uh, so we only have to have two deliveries a year. So we were cutting down sort of transport uh, costs and also we're trying to be doing that. Uh, adjacent to this building uh, is an innovation centre which was completed five years ago. And when we built the construction centre, uh, we took the opportunity of linking the two heating systems together. So that's how we've arrived at 19% of our floor area now running from biomass. Uh, this is the A-rated engineering wing which was completed two years ago. Uh, We've put on, on a roof, a flat roof demonstration area, so we can take sort of students and visitors and staff up there to show them some of the technologies in a sort of live working environment. So we've got solar, solar thermal, uh, photovoltaics, and we've also got evacuated tubes. And all those feed into the main college electricity system, and the evacuated tubes and the solar thermal uh, feed the showers uh, for the cycle uh, shower facilities. So in terms of six operational and IT operational initiatives we've done and also projects we've done to put, we've put in place to support sort of staff and students, uh, improve, environmental improvements now built into all maintenance plans. We have a college travel plan. We have a staff to work minibus scheme. Uh, this project uh, came about by staff who live in the south of the county uh, come to us a couple of years ago and saying you've got five college minibuses sitting in the car park overnight. Could we use them to get home on a sort of minibus service and we'll pay the fuel? So we've sort of rolled that scheme out. Uh, and staff in the north of the county said that seems like a good idea, can we do it as well? So we've rolled it out to them now. Uh, so they, they, they are using two minibuses day and night during term time uh, to come to and from work. And that so sort the of project has taken probably 18 to 19 cars uh, off the road per day because they're all sort of single users come in. We've tried a £500 interest free loan to staff to purchase cycle equipment uh, and the repayment is deducted from their salary over a two year period. Uh, we have secure and covered cycle storage facilities which are monitored by CCTV uh, and this was a key thing for staff who would sort of cycle in that they wanted that sort of confidence that their bikes were secure during the day. Uh, as part of the refurbishment projects, we've included staff change rooms and shower facilities. We also look at uh, emissions uh, of vehicles when we purchase new cars for the car fleet. We've also introduced recycling over the last five years, uh, so and that has now increased to where we're currently about 45% recycling and our aim is to get to 70% in the next two years. We've also uh, achieved Green Dragon Level 5, uh, which is a Welsh environmental sort of standard, uh, and that's equivalent to ISO 14001. From IT side, 95% of our printing is now double sided, uh, which has reduced our uh, paper consumption by 48% over a three year period. We have staff print and accounting and awareness uh, sessions. All computers purchased have 8% efficiency power packs. And computer software automatically shuts down computers into standby if they haven't been used for 15 minutes. So in terms of sort of space management, the work we've been doing uh, to improve sort of space management, uh, we have a space management committee 
uh, that was chaired by the college principal and meets on a regular basis. We've sent centralised timetabling. Timetabling now comes under the estates department. So from a curriculum point of view, where departments used to do their own timetabling, we've put that in centrally, so we've got a lot better control of timetabling. We've moved evening teaching to a Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, before it was running across the week, uh, and we were sort of staying open on Wednesday and Friday, sorry, on Monday and Friday for a very few classes. So we've put those together. Uh, we focused evening classroom teaching into two wings, whereas previously it was sort of dispersed around the college. And one of the big things we've done, uh, our cleaning operation is outsourced, so we have quite detailed discussions with our cleaning uh, contractor about moving cleaning from early morning to evening. Uh, because what we were finding, cleaners were coming in about half four in the morning, uh, and heating, lighting would be on from half four until the first staff, staff started coming in at sort of eight o'clock in the morning. So we moved into the evening, uh, cleaners are coming in uh, much earlier, it's, they're in from four o'clock. Uh, most days, on Tuesday and Thursday, they come in at six o'clock, and they work their way around sort of evening classes, so we can close down the building a lot, lot sooner. Uh, as part of the rationalisation of space, we've been able to vacate off-site premises uh, and centralise teaching onto one main site. Uh, we're going through a programme of new and refurbished teaching spaces uh, that's providing flexible learning environments, dual-purpose spaces, folding partitions between classrooms to overcome some classroom group size problems, and mobile laptop trolleys. And one of these initiatives is that there was a lot of call for more IT facilities across the college. So what we've introduced are mobile laptop facilities. Uh, so these are banks of 20 to 25 computers on a trolley that we can move between the sort of classrooms. Uh, and we have six of those stations now. And all workshops have electronic projectors and uh, electronic whiteboards. And this overcomes the sort of uh, engineering and construction areas have to book an IT room for perhaps 10-15 minutes just to deliver a short IT presentation. They can now do it in the workshops. So what benefits have we achieved by sort of those initiatives? We've reduced our electricity consumption by 32% over nine years. We've reduced our gas consumption by 54% over that same period. Uh, those two factors have resulted in year on year CO2 saving. In terms of our energy consumption, we're now about 149 kilowatt hours per square metre, so we're a lot lower than the UK quartile figure. And what we're predicting this year, with it being such a mild winter, we're going to be coming out probably about 124, 128 kilowatt hours. 149 is, was based on last winter, which was as you all were very cold. So the savings in usage resulted uh, in this financial year of us saving 71,000 uh, based on the original consumption levels in 0203. Uh, we've reduced our water consumption by 43% uh, by the any water saving measures we've introduced. Uh, and we've also improved the awareness of the wider organisation to the wider organisation, the environmental issues and we're finding staff and students have taken a lot more sort of ownership. So in terms of space utilisation, we've moved from 16% to 36%. We've reduced 15 classrooms on the main college site to accommodate an increase in staff office requirements. Uh, and that has meant we haven't had to expand the college for those 15 classrooms, which has saved us about 700,000 uh, in terms of capital cost. And we've also released off-site accommodation. Just a couple of quick graphs to indicate uh, where our electricity costs have been benchmarked uh, against 0203 consumption. And the white line at the top is where we would have been, uh, and the red line is where we where actually are. So our cumulative year savings in terms of electricity over, since 0203 sorry, using over 203 as a benchmark figure is nearly £229,000. 
and just show the same graphs in terms of uh, gas consumption. Uh, that's just tracking our costs compared to the 0203 benchmarks. And in terms of cumulative gas savings, uh, it's just over 221,000 pounds. Future projects under consideration, and these are really sort of set out in terms of uh, payback periods, uh, voltage optimization system, which we're currently uh, progressing, that has a payback period of four years. We're looking at further heating zones in the main college building, uh, which currently will we'll have a payback period of about five to six years. PV installation, payback period of eight to nine years. Site by biomass boiler system, that's got a payback period of about 10 years. And wind turbines, depending on what type you go for with the feed-in tariff, you're looking somewhere between six and 12 to 14 years. So just briefly sort of considering uh, 10 points to consider for the green ground application, that's very much covering what sort of steam panels have talked about uh, sort of earlier. Clear information, not too technical. Bullet point the initiatives and achievements. Data should be relevant. Benchmark the information data to illustrate how successful the project is. And if possible, if you're looking at new food, new build and refurbishment, illustrate between design and actual performance. Highlight what makes the project stand out. Highlight staff and learn your community involvement. Set out the savings made, both financial and CO2. Timeline the achievements. And what has been done to promote the project to enable others to learn. I think those are very much the same sort of messages that uh, have been sort of given before. So I think it's sort of pleasing to see that we've all come from that same sort of background with that. So I've been asked to give three key messages in terms of carbon reduction, establish a program of improvements which is financially viable, and try to some quick, quick means in building up that credibility, accurate data monitoring and recording and energy system controls is a key, and engagement with staff and learners, both from an awareness perspective and also their ideas for improvement. So, next steps, uh, making the most of you at membership. Uh, the overview presentations today have been on sustainable procurement, green ICT and carbon reduction and space efficiency, and the 2012 Green Gallery Awards entries will be open in the summer 2012. Okay, so thank you for listening and any questions? A couple. Yeah. <laughs> You mentioned about savings for gas and electricity in yes. 2002. Does that include the annual increase in cost of gas and electricity? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah. And under your space efficiency, have I mean, most universities have expanded. Since 1994, our campus has doubled in size. In the last few years, we've got rid of a few older buildings, and I think great. And now we're going to build a new life sciences building, which is high energy use. So our energy figures are about to do this. <laughs> and it makes it very difficult for us to say that we are saving energy here and here, because we actually are, but we're adding a, another new scanner that puts spikes into our energy curves. Yeah, but so I, I, I think it's looking at benchmarking on that kilowatt hour basis and taking right. those into consideration. One thing I didn't mention in here, uh, our new IT equipment that we've purchased since 0203 to present day, uh, we've calculated what the, the wattage of that and how much that uses, and that actually gets, equates to 20% of our daily usage of electricity, just in terms of IT equipment bought uh, in the last eight years. So yes, your point is very valid in terms of you, you need to monitor what equipment's being bought, otherwise it doesn't go through all of your data. I think we've actually done everything you've mentioned here. Yes. <laughs> and I mean, all our IT suites automatically shut down the building just now, as in student IT suites. We have 3,500 PCs across campuses and students and staff. Our biggest problem, you can't say if everybody does, is staff switching on and off the personal PCs. We can't put in software because we have issues with loss of data. The staff will be files open on the desktop and they won't lock keyboards, they won't shut down. Uh, Funny story, I met staff since the other day. I left my PC running for two years, so 
so I can access my home directory from home. And, and, uh, but just log into Netstore and you can get your home directory. But I have to keep my computer running. <laughs> so there's lots of myths out there. Yes, uh, yeah. I just wondered if you've got that software into your staff's PCs. Yes, we have. Yeah. So how did you get around the problem of lost data to where files open? It goes into sort of standby and what we have really had any sort of problems in terms of what I've been told is that uh, the information when staff leave the VCs, if it, in terms of Word, PowerPoint, Excel, those files can automatically be, be recovered. From, from well, I might ask for the, the name of the software package okay. so you get Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you uh, sort of kill half me to a target. Uh, was that right across the institution, or did you have separate targets for different types of the building use? And so I'm thinking of um, you know, it's a bit more engineering or PC heavy compared to an um, other area. Yeah, no, that that is across the whole campus. Right. Uh, one of the projects we're working with the Carbon Trust in Wales at the moment is trying to establish different kilowatt hour usage for different types of building. So as part of the automatic monitoring metering project, uh, that's been expanded to look at those issues across different buildings. So as now they can capture the, the information. Yeah, that's true. What I was asking whether you sort of sub zone that into different areas have different targets for different new usage of buildings. Because of, not so much because of the way that our sort of campus is laid out, and we've got various disciplines intermingled between. We've got engineering next to fitness suites next to classrooms. So so we haven't been able, we can't sort of split our energy consumption down into that level of detail unfortunately. Most of the projects in terms of what we've sort of been done been done by the estates department, uh, some have been in conjunction with the IT departments as well. Uh, so it's really been a what we can it's been a partnership approach uh, and getting everyone on board with the sort of projects where we can and sort of collaborating with the, with the different departments. Uh, and I think one of the key things from getting the curriculum areas uh, to save energy in that we've been able to demonstrate what we've Maybe in terms of energy savings, that's been allowed them to buy more equipment in the curriculum areas. So we've, we've done it that way, so we can get that buy in. So we've, we've said if we want to make the energy savings, we want to be able to buy that piece of equipment. Which, which, yeah, which makes it more real life to them, I think.